Good afternoon. Welcome to Inside Indiana Sports Now with Kent Sterling. It's Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. We're brought to you by, oh, Cinco de Mayo. Happy Cinco de Mayo, y'all. We're brought to you by the great people of today's dentistry. The number, 317-849-2933. Dr. Mike O'Neill, the best dentist I've ever gone to. The only dentist I've gone to the last 27 years. Punch subscribe, punch like, ring the bell. Let's go. Let's talk about sports. We found out a little bit earlier today that the Colts are going to welcome Eric Fisher to town this weekend. He's going to pay a visit. They're going to go over some things, and they're going to do a medical on Eric Fisher because in January, in a playoff game between the Chiefs and the Bills, Eric Fisher, the left tackle for the Chiefs, tore his Achilles tendon. The Colts are very interested in signing Eric Fisher as a free agent. The Chiefs decided to cut bait with Eric Fisher. They didn't want to pay him a lot of money, so they moved him off the books, and now he's out on the street. When healthy, he's one of the best 10 left tackles in football and maybe one of the best five. A perennial pro bowler, first overall pick several years ago. Eric Fisher, when healthy, is really, really good, and I would prefer a healthy Eric Fisher over a healthy Charles Leno, the former left tackle of the Chicago Bears. However, we only know that Charles Leno is happy. We don't know that Eric Fisher's healthy or that he's ever going to be healthy again. That's why they're going to do the medical evaluation. The Colts, they have been in contact with Charles Leno, who is called by Bears fans, uh, Speed Bump Charlie. So there you go, because he is only a speed bump between the defensive end and who used to be the Bears quarterback, Mitch Trubisky. So there you go. But I have no respect for Bears fans. I don't think they know anything about the game because they continue to back Ryan Pace. And the Chicago media continues to back Ryan Pace despite all evidence to the contrary. The Bears are not a very good football team, and Ryan Pace has been the architect of that roster for a long time. He moved up one spot, traded to get the draft rights for Mitch Trubisky. One spot from three to two. How'd that work out? He just traded up nine spots for the draft rights of Justin Fields. So Fields may be really, really good. Might wind up being terrific. I hope that he is. However, given that the Colts haven't had a high quality and sturdy, this is where Jim McMahon's eliminated, quarterback, starting quarterback since 1950, I don't trust Ryan Pace to go out and get that done. We'll see Charles Leno versus Eric Fisher how the Colts want to play that. If I were Chris Ballard, I got $25 million under the cap. If I can sign both those guys to a one-year prove-it deal, I sign them both. Because, look, here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to go into this season without a true starting left tackle, and there is not one on the Colts roster. I need Charles Leno or I need Eric Fisher. And if, if Chris Ballard can sign either one of these guys to a deal – And they can play this coming year. And that's where the Fisher health thing kind of comes into play. Wow. You know what? A pretty good job in the draft. Taking Quiddy Pay at 21. Not trading back. Right? And then not trading up in the second round. Instead of taking Deo Odiyingbo, instead of taking Deo, they move up and they take a left tackle. This is much better. Much better. Kick the can down the road. And if you can get another three good years out of Eric Fisher, who's 30, You know what? You have, I think, sufficiently solved your problem. Again, as long as he's healthy, and if he's healthy, man, you line Eric Fisher up with Quentin Nelson, Ryan Kelly, Mark Lewinsky, and Braden Smith, that's the best offensive line in football. And all of a sudden, instead of the Colts scratching their heads and other body parts wondering what they're going to do at the left tackle position, they got a guy. And that guy is going to really solidify the protection for Carson Wentz, which has got to be done, and opening up lanes in the running game because that is what Eric Fisher can do. He is really, really good at both. He's a good run blocker, good pass protector. Charles Leno, good run blocker, okay pass protector. That's who he is. But if you can get Eric Fisher, Eric Fisher can play the way that he played for the Chiefs, and that's a big if. You really got something, and you got a team that could wind up being very, very good, depending on uh, Odiengbo and his Achilles. My God, how many Achilles tears do we have kind of preying upon the roster of the Indianapolis Colts, potentially, right? Malik Hooker tore his Achilles. Marlon Mack 
tore his Achilles. You just drafted Deo Odiingbo out of Vanderbilt, torn Achilles right before the Senior Bowl. And now you may sign Eric Fisher as a guy with a torn and now healing Achilles tendon. What are you going to do? Maybe the Colts are going to figure out at a really high level through experience how to rehab these things and become a destination for free agents and for any football player who's like, hey, I tore my Achilles. How do I get back on the field? The Colts? The Colts know these things. The Colts have figured it out. Look at what they did with Eric Fisher. Look at what they did with Marlon Mack. Look at Deo Odiingbo. My God. And who knows about Malik Hooker? But maybe the Colts kind of developed this expertise through experience that makes them a destination. If they can sign Eric Fisher and Eric Fisher can play, let's say the last half of the season, and and you go with Sam, you go with him, for the first half of the season, and you kind of eke by, you got a real chance to raise some hell. The AFC is interesting. Aaron Rodgers, if Aaron Rodgers, look, if he goes to Denver, I think that'd be great because that'd be a complete pain in the ass for the Kansas City Chiefs. The AFC West would be thrown into chaos, right? But what that would mean in all likelihood is the Chiefs and the Broncos wind up going to the playoffs, and that eats up a wild card spot and makes the AFC all that tougher. The NFC kind of opens up, right? Who knows how well Tom Brady's going to be able to play. If you take Aaron Rodgers out of the NFC and plop him into the AFC, the AFC becomes a mother, right? And the NFC is kind of like, eh, who you got? Like the, the teams in the NFC East are terrible. Eagles, Giants, Cowboys, and WFT, you know, they're terrible. The NFC North, the Lions, Vikings, uh, but the Packers without Rodgers, and then the Bears are at best a 500 team. Where, where do you find the excellence? And, and then the the NFC West, who have you got? You got Seattle, who's kind of fading fast. You got the 49ers, who have faded and now have a rookie quarterback, but Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be their guy this year. Okay, sure. You got the Arizona Cardinals and you've got the Los Angeles Rams. All right. Maybe the Rams can kind of get things going with Matthew Stafford. I don't know, but the NFC all of a sudden opens up for a team just to take. And I think it's going to be the Bucs and Tom Brady, right? Anyway, what the, what the Colts choose to do this weekend is going to be fascinating to me. I can't wait to see it. That if they sign Eric Fisher, Wonderful, but he's got to play. If they sign Charles Leno, you know, it's not a it's a for Charles Leno. However, it's better than what we got. And that's a, that's a reason to celebrate, right? Especially on Cinco de Mayo. Let's talk about the Pacers for a minute. Pacers, they host the Sacramento Kings this afternoon. This is going to be an interesting game. And this is an interesting stretch of the season. It just got a whole lot more interesting last night and this morning as Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN reported, that there is there is craziness within the Pacers' locker room and, and within the staff and on that roster because you've got tumult. That's, a, that's his word. You've got tumult, and you don't want tumult. You don't want chaos. You don't want tumult because of communication issues between the head coach and the team and the staff. You can't have it. So the, the deal is Nate Bjorkman might be in trouble as a first head year or first year coach of the Pacers. 30 and 34 going into tonight's game. They got eight games left. They're gonna squeak into this play-in nonsense, right? And we're we're gonna see where they wind up. And you gotta see where they wind up before you cast aspersions and take away the job of Nate Nate Bjorkman. Okay, so let's talk about the six reasons why. The Pacers should not fire Nate Bjorkman while giving you this reason. If that entire roster has been turned against or Nate Bjorkman has turned that roster against him, coach has got to go. You can get rid of the players or you can get rid of the coach, which is easier. If he's lost the team, irretrievably lost the team, then he's got to go. But let's talk about the six reasons that there are that you keep him. Look, he is a first-time NBA coach. He needs a year to figure out what the hell he's doing. 
being a head coach in the NBA is a hell of a lot different than being an assistant coach in the NBA or being a head coach in the G League. It's a huge, chasmic difference, and Bjorkman's got to figure that out. And the Pacers, I hope, have built into their mindset a little bit of patience there for Nate Bjorkman. I think Kevin Pritchard understands what he did when he hired Nate Bjorkman. Number five, it's a completely different system on both sides of the ball, right? Nate McMillan to Nate Bjorkman is night as today. The offense, much, much different. The defense, much, much different. The defense has been terrible. The other night, the Pacers allowed 50 assists. That's terrible defense. You can get five ambulatory 45-year-olds to run out on an NBA court and keep a team from getting 50 assists. 50 assists. I remember when the goal for the Pacers was 25 under McMillan. Look, Nate McMillan, what he tried to do was eke out ugly games because that's the roster that he had. So that's what they did. Fans said, well, this is ugly basketball. You know what, though? Last year, with that roster that he had, Nate McMillan would have won 50-plus games if not for COVID-19. That is absolutely true and accurate. And this year, Bjorkren, in a 72-game season, is going to be very, very, very fortunate to win as many as he loses. Pacers have not been good at home. They're really kind of good on the road. Number four, it's a COVID year. There are challenges that are not basketball related that have caused chaos on these teams. Guys are getting tested every day. There's uh, The entire thing is kind of a pain in the ass. Some teams have sort of embraced it and overcome it, and others haven't. The Pacers, one of those teams that has really not overcome the challenges of COVID-19. Number three, it's a non-traditional season schedule. It started later than usual. You had a truncated uh, kind of a preseason without games. This has been really, really difficult for the Indiana Pacers and, and for the NBA. Now, again, maybe the Pacers have not handled it as well as other teams have, and that's a problem. However, it's different, and next year it's going to be back to normal, and that may be a situation where you can judge Nate Bjorkren as a head coach with a little bit more circumspection than you can this year. How about number two? Injuries. T.J. Warren, out the entire season, leading scorer for the team. Vic was never healthy. You trade Vic to go get Karis LeVert, but Karis LeVert's got a growth on his kidney, and the kidney has to be removed. So he's still recovering from that, despite the fact that he's scoring pretty damn well. Then you've got Miles Turner out with a bad big toe, the captain of the foot. The captain of the foot is broken, and thus, Miles Turner not playing. They're hoping to have him back for whatever portion of the playoffs the Pacers are able to participate in. Sabonis, so he's missed games with a bad back. Malcolm Brogdon has missed games per usual, this time with a strained right hamstring. It has been really, really difficult for Nate Bjorkman and everybody associated with this team to put together what they need to be competitive in the NBA. They're going with second-level, tertiary-level guys like Edmund Sumner. Sumner's been terrific on the offensive end, but he can't defend anybody. You In a bad matchup, Edmund Sumner is skinny, man, and you put him against a starting level two or three in the NBA, he's going to have all kinds of problems. He's not a starting level player on the defensive end. Offensively, he's really pretty damn good. Uh, number one, the season isn't over. It's not over. So let's judge once it is. And I'll give you another one. I'll give you a seven. The Simons don't play that. They do not pay people not to work. That is not what the Simons do as owners in the NBA. The longest standing owners in the NBA, really the most, I don't know, maybe sedentary is the wrong word, but the most stable, certainly, franchise in the NBA. So there you go. Is he going to be fired? I don't think he will be, and I don't think it would be right if he was. Now, he's not terribly charismatic, so he's not doing a great job of selling the franchise and the product either. But these guys, they got to figure out a way to play for him, and Nate's got to figure out a way to communicate with him that does not cause chaos. There you go. Tomorrow morning, Breakfast with Kent. Hopefully we're celebrating a Pacers win that game, 8 o'clock tonight at Bankers Life Fieldhouse, 6 o'clock straight up, Breakfast with Kent on Facebook Live and immediately thereafter on YouTube. Subscribe, like, follow, do all that stuff. Let's go.